Hello, my name is Lavana Nahan, and I'm a culinary historian here in New York, and I also covered the landmass that was New Netherland. I specialize in the 17th through 19th century hearth years that we have in our region. I am also the interpreter of African American history for New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. And it is my pleasure to be with you this evening to help you understand some of the flavors and dishes of the Dutch period of New Netherland that are quite relevant for this time of year. I want to thank Kralo for this opportunity and also if you have any questions regarding what you will be seeing here today, feel free to reach out to either Sam or Heidi here at Kralo and they will pass the information on to me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. We're taking three receipts. Receipt is the word that would have been used as we use recipe. It's used in our country all the way into the middle of the 20th century. The three receipts that we will be covering today come from the travels of Peter Kahn. Peter Kahn was an apostle of Linnaeus. Linnaeus is the scientist who set up the nomenclature, the naming processes based on Latin of plants that we use to this very day. He had several apostles that he sent to different parts of the world. Peter Kahn came north to us. His book really is fabulous to read. It discusses his life, his travels, but is also very detailed about plants, both edible and not, and the environment of New York. He spends time in New York City, he spends time in Albany, so it is a really usable, fun read, and something I invite you to perhaps pick up over the winter when you're sitting in that chair wanting to be a traveler. Not only do you travel in our region, but you will step back into a history that you can bring forward as you drive through the winding roads that we have here in New York, imagining Peter exploring them for the very first time. Several of the dishes that we're doing are very, all of the dishes that we're doing are very common. They are, however, showing us the mix of cultures coming together here in the New Netherland period. They use cornmeal, native to North America and South America, a gift from the indigenous to the rest of the world. They're using pumpkins. Some pumpkins were native here, others were brought from Europe. And we have this mixture of pumpkins and gourds going back and forth. This time of year, a lot of our historic pumpkins and gourds that are edible are being used as decoration. So we'll talk about those too. You want to get them off your front porch and into your kitchen. Cabbage, a mainstay in Northern European diets, shows up in his travels as well. So we'll start with just a little ideas about pumpkins and gourds. calling it a cushion. It is also called a crook neck. There are two squashes that we that have a crook neck that um, the names that we use now often didn't go then. There's a summer squash. We tend to call it a yellow squash. We pick it very early when the skin is very thin. But if you let that squash remain on the vine, it actually will the outside tender skin hardens up. That is also called a crook neck. Just like the kushaw, which also has a crook neck, you can seed them, stuff them, bake them, boil them. They're very versatile squash. This is one of my favorites. This is a turban. 
In Peter Combs' references to pumpkin, he often talks about people cutting them in half, taking the seeds out, putting the lid back on, and then baking them. This is one of those types of squashes that you can do that with. You just cut right here along its natural line, and the lid pops right off. The seeds are easy to scoop out. I tend to do that with a spoon. It's easier, the easiest tool to do those, that with. Um, all of your squashes and pumpkins, actually, is to use either a teaspoon or a tablespoon. You can stuff it, put the lid back on, and then you can bake it off in your oven. There are so many varieties of what we want to call the jack-o'-lantern pumpkin. This is actually the least flavorful of all the pumpkins and edible gourds. The seeds, however, are wonderful to roast. So if you are, if you've already not saved your seeds from Halloween, but you still have an extra pumpkin hanging out, do before you discard them. Take those seeds out, roast them up. They're a nice snack. There are variations of this type of pumpkin, and these are the types that I find more uh, enjoyable flesh to eat. You have a shorter squatter one that's not as variated, call it cheese pumpkin, and then you would also have pumpkins like this. Some of the ones that have all, looks like growths on them, those really are edible, although most people feel a little queasy about the skin, so they don't. But just know, when you see these, always think of them first as edible. Some of the smaller gourds, however, are not. And those are um, generally tend to be the crook necks, but even those small pumpkins, similar to this but squat, you can use those as baking dishes for either a nice pumpkin puree or a mousse, or even do something like an apple crisp inside that pumpkin shell. The mixture of foods that the indigenous uh, gave mixed with the Dutch was adapted by all of the cultures here in our area. There are things that the Dutch would eat, the British, the French, the Germans, and the enslaved and freed Africans. Cornmeal becomes the great equalizer, particularly when the wheat crops fail. Wheat is the dominant cash crop once we get out of the fur, uh, fur trade period. It is grown all over the Hudson River Valley into the Mohawk River Valley, and even post-Revolutionary War, it's moved west and central. Once the Erie Canal opens, all of that land up there will be planted in wheat. Wheat is probably the cash crop of New York for a good 250 years. There are a number of historic mills in our area that are still grinding their own grain, both wheat, barley, rye, and corn. So if you have an opportunity to take a drive or you pass a mill or perhaps you at a farm stand or a farm store and you see locally uh, produced grains, please take the time to taste them. Buy a little bit, and the sampan, the cornmeal mush, also called cuckoo for the West Africans, is a beautiful dish and a great way to taste cornmeal in its most refined state. So we're going to take a pause, and then we'll jump right into the recipe. There are three receipts that we're going to be doing today. The first is going to be a cabbage salad. Peter Kahn was staying with a woman named Mrs. Vischer. He says that he had never seen or eaten this particular salad. Cabbage salad is actually the ancestor for the coleslaw many of us enjoy today. And I have to be honest, I'm not a fan of mayonnaise, so I tend actually to make the cabbage salad all through the year. The dressing on the salad is um, Mrs. Vischer used oil. That would have been olive oil. 
which was available but rather expensive. The noted Dutch food historian Peter Rose said more often than not they use melted butter. I suggest if you choose to use the butter, please do clarify it first. To clarify butter, you simply take a stick, cut it into chunks, very slowly melt it in a small pot on your stove. On top of the butter, you will see this white foam. Those are milk solids. Just take a small spoon and scoop those off and discard them. You want the clear yellow liquid in between. That's pure butter. The white residue left in the bottom of the pot is also milk solids. So just very carefully tilt your small saucepan, pouring that butter into a cup or a small bowl. When you'll see the milk solids on the bottom start to create a V as if they were going to join in the party, stop. You will not be able to get all of the clear clarified butter off. You'll leave about a teaspoon or so in the actual pot, but that's okay. It's, it's better than having those milk solids join in. If you would like to fry with butter, if you actually, like I do, I pop my popcorn in clarified butter. Removing the milk solids actually allows you to raise the cooking temperature of the butter. The butter is added to the cabbage salad right before you serve it. I prefer doing the oil and vinegar and then letting the salad actually stand anywhere from 15 minutes to several hours. The acidity of the vinegar actually helps cook the cabbage, making it a little softer. One of the variations on the cabbage salad that you can do is also to add perhaps some apples, if you want to fine julienne them or grate them in, and also some carrots. But the basic salad is this. You want to take a cabbage, you're going to move the outside leaves. And I hope you compost. Even in an urban area, you can do that these days. Take your knife, and depending upon how much you want to make, it depends on how much of the cabbage you actually want to use. And we're going to, I will start on the side, not the core. Take your time. The center of a cabbage is very dense. Rotate it around. And we're going to cut it in half again. Lay it to the side. You'll see your core. Just cut that right out. leaves like this that come off, do move them out of the way. Your knife can slip on them and then you can hurt yourself. Peter Kahn, in his description of this salad, is very clear that Mrs. Vischer cuts the slices of cabbage very thin. So it's almost a shave. Take your time and then gently shave down. Also, if you're working on a cutting board, like this one. I forgot my own tip. Take a dish towel or a wet paper towel and put it under your board. That actually keeps your board from traveling. And you'll have a much steadier surface to work on. You notice I'm not doing this in one big hack. Kind of have to saw through your cabbage. And you notice I'm also working the wedge of cabbage off the flat side. Never work it where it will roll. Always work from a flat side. Then we're going to take our cabbage and put it in the bowl. Use your fingers to break it up. Onto the cabbage, the ingredients are very simple. You're going to use a little bit of salt, if you use salt at all. Some freshly ground black pepper, or whatever black pepper you have. I prefer apple cider vinegar. Just a 
little bit of that over. And then just a light drizzle of olive oil. Give that a nice toss around. If you're going to be serving this for dinner or within the next couple of hours, I would just leave it standing out. I would not refrigerate it. You can, though, if you're going to be using this for the next day, perhaps getting ready for Thanksgiving and you or another large meal and you want to just get it out of the way, um, put it in a refrigeratable bowl. Put plastic over it if you want it in your serving bowl or you could do it with whatever you know, variation of Tupperware you have. Put it in your refrigerator, but do bring it out at least 20 minutes before you're serving it so it's closer to room temperature, not that ice refrigerator cold. And there you have a Dutch cabbage salad. Our second receipt is going to be pumpkin pancakes. Pumpkin was used in a lot of different ways. Most of us now have reduced it down to a puree that we use when we make pumpkin pies. Pumpkin was often eaten with meat, either boiled separately or roasted separately and then used as a side dish. It makes a wonderful addition to a soup. Instead of using white potatoes, if you wanted something more flavorful, you could add chunks of pumpkin. But for this, this is a play on a Native American variation of a, a simple pancake. Pancakes, for most of us in our modern world, we think tall and fluffy and covered with maple syrup. In fact, pancake is really just a simple, quick, flat bread. It is something that you will see throughout Dutch uh, genre paintings, still used throughout the Dutch culture today as a bread. Historic pancakes are actually very thin, more like crepes than uh, the risen ones that we're familiar with today. We don't get the taller ones until the late 19th century when we start working with chemical leavenings. Peter says that there are actually only two ingredients in the pumpkin pancakes. There's mashed pumpkin and cornmeal. So we're going to start with a little of the mashed pumpkin. I'm going to put it in our bowl. And to that, we're just going to be stirring in a little cornmeal. Keep stirring that in until we get a nice, a nice batter. Now this batter will not be runny. It's going to be thick. And these are better fried, about the size of what we would call a silver dollar pancake. Okay, just a little bit. I know you're wondering, isn't she going to give us measurements? Actually, no, because they didn't. There are very few receipts we have where they use measurements. Most of them are related to baking. When they did measure, it would have been about pounds and ounces. So you're going to have to trust your gut. The wonderful thing is, though, if you feel that you have added too much cornmeal and you don't want to do that whole game of back and forth with the pumpkin and the cornmeal and end up with a giant bowl, just add a little bit of water. But please start with the water a tablespoon at a time. I think we have a nice density here. And these will be able to shape up in our frying pan to give us a nice flat pancake. To the pumpkin batter, if you wanted to add a little pumpkin pie, pumpkin pie spice, you can do that. Or just a little fresh grated nutmeg, 
perhaps a little cinnamon. One of the things, though, I would suggest you don't do is add sugar to them. Sugar was actually added on top of pancakes as opposed to in the batter. But don't think of this as a breakfast dish. Do consider using this perhaps as a side to some roasted pork or some baked or braised chicken. There are a number of ways that you can enjoy these outside of the breakfast table. In many Dutch genre paintings, we have sample after sample of women sitting by the fire on various and assorted sizes of stools holding these long saucepans, these pancake pans, getting ready to prepare them over the fire. Again, traditional Dutch pancakes are very thin, like crepes. So you want to keep that in mind as you set up your pumpkin pancakes. Because the batter is thick, the tendency would be to make them really tall and thick. But just press them down a little bit. So I've had just a little bit of oil to our skillet. You might not use that trivet. Take a small spoonful. You want to be sure to preheat your skillet. Press them down. Shape them up nice. Again, they're better small. You want to think almost the size of a, a nice corn fritter or potato pancake. Use the back of the spoon, press them down, shape them up. If you're one of those people where they absolutely have to be the exact same size, this batter, you could use a cookie scoop. Particularly if you're working with children and everyone, you know, they want the exact same thing, that will give you perfect equal measures. Once you have them in your skillet, too big, that one may be a little big. I would fry these over a medium high heat. So we're all nice and brown on both sides. Now we can plate them up and get ready for dinner. The third receipt we're going to be doing today is a very common supper dish called sampan. It actually is a cornmeal mush. We're going to be using two very simple ingredients, cornmeal and boiling water. The trick to making the mush is that you, when you start, the water absolutely has to be at a rolling boil. It is that hot water that is cooking the cornmeal. Again, it's a proportion amount. Generally, if you want a loose pudding or a loose porridge style, it would be one cup 
of boiling water to one third cup of cornmeal. And then from there, you can add a little bit more if you want it thicker. So using those proportions, that would give you a nice loose porridge, but we're gonna make it a little thicker. There are a, a one, there is one um, sketch someone did in period, and what appears as the sampan in the center of the dish is rather thick. Now this dish is also adapted all over the world. Through the African Africans and African diaspora, it becomes kuku in West Africa, but throughout the Caribbean and the West Indies, it's called turn cornmeal, it's called cornmeal mush, it is the base of cornmeal dumplings. It is also the base for the southern hot water cornbread, where you would make the batter and then shape it and then fry it. It is also the same base for what we would call a hoe cake or a johnny cake, again, cornmeal and boiling hot water. Of course, at home on your stove, you're going to be standing, not kneeling on a hearth. But one of the things you want to have ready, have your water at a rolling boil. When you have your wooden spoon, the flatter the spoon, the better. And you want to work with the back of the spoon, not the bowl. By working with the bowl, especially the deep bowl, the cornmeal will attach and you'll end up losing, a, uh, releasing a big wad of raw cornmeal into the actual dish. So you're going to pretend that the back of the spoon is actually the front of the spoon and you want to get that water moving. And then slowly, just add your cornmeal in. start to thicken up. You can come closer. If you start to lump up, just really stir very, very quickly. Scrape it down and add a little more. But as the cornmeal starts to cook, you want to stop adding because you don't want to end up with a raw cornmeal taste. If you prefer, you can add just a little bit of salt into it. You'll notice that many of the recipes don't really call for salt. Salt is an, uh, is an imported ingredient coming to New York from the Caribbean. As you cook, you'll notice that the porridge will get thicker and thicker and thicker. It'll start actually working its way into a ball. As I said, if you want a looser porridge, you want to start with about one quarter cup of, I mean, one third cup of cornmeal to one cup of water. And we're going to move this take this handle off before we end up with a small disaster. And we're going to move our pot over here to the cutting board. So we've transferred the sand pan from the pot onto our serving plate. Now they just talk about a center where you add the milk. You can see it's a nice stiff porridge. So you can just shape it in. People eat from the outside in, and then just gently pour some milk into the center. Hopefully you all have a better aim than I do. But you can also, some of the drawings talk about rivers, and everyone eats their portion between. So you can either do center, or you can share it. Everyone has their little equal portion. This was a communal dish. 
everyone would have their spoon and their bit would fall in between. So you have your little river of milk. So you can leave it in the center or you can portion it off. Starting from the outside, you can scoop with your spoon a little of the porridge, dip it in the milk, and there you go. So we have our pumpkin pancakes, a nice side dish for any savory meal, or you can if you want to do sweet. Again, I lean towards our local maple syrup. We have the Sam Pan and the cabbage salad. All easily reproduced historic dishes from the travels of Peter Kalm in North America, bringing us back to the rich Dutch culture and heritage that is both New Netherland and New York. So thank you very much, and again, we will have a list of the ingredients for each of the recipes attached. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Craylo and they will forward the information on to me. Thank you very much. Have a lovely fall.